Hello and welcome to An Academy India's largest online learning platform and also welcome to my session today on the Companies Act 2013 Part 2. Part 2 why? Because about a few hours ago I took, ahead, I took Part 1 which covered the various topics. So today we shall be looking at Part 2 and covering further important topics. All right. So like I said, welcome to Unacademy India's largest online learning platform. Unacademy provides you an array of resources and courses for you to choose, choose according to your interest and uh, take advantage of the contents provided. A brief introduction about the speaker today, the educator today, that's me, Prateek Gupta. Hello, I am a BCom graduate from Christ College, Bangalore University. I am an associate member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. I am an associate member of the Institute of Company Secretaries of India and also an associate member of the Institute of Cost Accountants of India. Along with this, I am a law graduate from Karnataka State Law University, currently a practicing chartered accountant and also teach CA students both online and offline. Prior to starting my own practice, I worked with SR Bartlebar and Associates, that is the Indian member firm of Ernst & Young Global. And uh, after that, I worked with Ernst & Young in the Mergers and Acquisition Department with SR Bartlebar & Co. I worked in the Audit and Assurance Department. Post that, I worked with the Manipal Group for a few years as the Corporate Controller of the Indian entity and the German entity. So that's a brief introduction about me. It's a pleasure to address you all today. Thank you so much for joining in. Hello, Ritija. How are you? Thanks for joining in. All right. What do you get when you subscribe to the Unacademy platform? You get daily live classes where you get to attend the class of your choice, the edu educator of your choice. And not only this, you also get to chat with him, your educator, him or her, and clear your doubts on a real time basis. Next, you get live tests and quizzes to evaluate your performance and know where you stand so that you, you identify your weakness and work towards improving it. And you also identify your strengths and um, help covering other areas. The Unacademy provides structured courses to you. <coughs> Unacademy provides structured courses to you to ensure that you uh, prepare step by step and no point of preparation is left behind. So it helps you identifying the core areas and your weakness and helps you build on that. And lastly, but most importantly, unlimited access to all the content courses and resources on the Unacademy platform is provided to you right at your fingertips at your convenience. You can use it or access it whenever you want. Hi, Sujata. Thanks for joining in. Welcome to my session. So for the people who have not downloaded the Unacademy learning app yet, I request you to please download the Unacademy learning app from your Play Store and um, take advantage of all the contents, courses and resources provided by Unacademy. It's quite a simple process. You need to download the app, uh, put in the mobile number and register yourself using an OTP. So I look forward to seeing you around in an academy and an academy also provides various subscription packages for its plus module. Um, the packages provided for CA foundation and intermediate course are as follows. The packages are for one month, three months, six months, 12 months and 24 months. The prices of the package are displayed on your screen. You can have a look at it. And uh, while subscribing to a package of your choice, Please do not forget to use the code Pratik, P-R-A-T-H-I-K, to get a discount of 10% on your subscription price. So all the best to you. All right, so just a quick recap of what we did earlier in the session in part one. We studied a little about the Companies Act. We started studying about the Companies Act. The Companies Act was enacted to consolidate the, uh, and amend the law relating to companies. Erstwhile, the laws relating to companies was contained in Companies Act 1956 which was replaced in 2013. Similarly, prior to 1956, we had another company's law uh, to administer to the companies then and the companies incorporated under them also were are called companies and covered under the Companies Act 2013. So applicability of the Companies Act, like I said, I will go a little faster here because I'm recapping on what we've done already. Uh, the company, it applies to all the companies incorporated under the Companies Act, whether this act or the previous act. It, uh, it applies to insurance companies as long as the provisions do not conflict with the provisions of the Insurance Act 1938 and the IRBA Act 1999. It also applies to all the banking companies as long as the provisions do not coincide or conflict with uh, the Banking Regulation Act 1949. 
companies engaged in generation and supply of electricity except for the provisions similarly the companies which are engaged in providing electricity are governed by the electricity act 2003 so the companies act 2003 will apply to it as as long as it does not conflict with as long as it does not conflict with the provisions of the respective electricity act or the act that applies to it any other company governed by any special law or act for the time being in india and uh, if any any company is notified by the central government or state government in official gazette to be treated as a company then that will also be covered under the companies act 2013 at any point of my session if you have any doubts please feel free to ask me all right I, uh, at least for the next uh, three or four slides i will be going a little fast because i'm recapping on what we've done already uh, company meaning and features section 220 of the companies act 2013 defines the term company Company means a company incorporated under the uh, Companies Act, whether it is uh, 2013, 1956, or the Act before that. The features of a company, separate legal entity, like I told you, once a company is formed, it is separate, le separate and legally distinct from its members, and um, it functions through its board of directors. It has perpetual succession. Perpetual succession simply means members come and go, shares, transfers happen, directors come and go, but the company will not die as long as it is not officially wound up it has a limited liability all the members of the company of a company limited by shares has un, has limited liability their liability is limited to the extent of the person a, a company is not a real person it is not born out of a person so it is an artificial person which can sue and which can also be sued and it can hold property in its name Hi, Zishan Sayad. Welcome to the session. Thanks for joining in. Uh, it is, it can sue and it can be sued. It can hold properties on its behalf. It can hold agents and it can uh, work that way. And a common seal. Hi, Sakshi. Welcome to the session. Thank you. Um, common seal, like I said, a company uh, operates through a common seal. A common seal was mandatory under the Companies Act 1956, but it is optional under the Companies Act 2013. A common seal is a symbol that acknowledges on behalf of the company of certain documents. Any questions, please ask me. Now, these, this is what I have just explained. I request you to take about 30 seconds and go through the slide and ask me if you have any questions. Just go through this. Take about 30 seconds. Hello, Mrs. Hema, how are you? Thanks for joining in. Welcome to my session. Okay, if you read the limited liability point, it is uh, for a company limited by shares, the amount of liability is limited to the amount unpaid on the shares. Limited by guarantee, it is the amount limited to the uh, amount guaranteed by the subscribers in the memorandum. And in case of an unlimited company, the, the liability is unlimited, but we do not see too many unlimited companies in India anymore. Hello, Ms. Hema. How are you? Thanks for joining in. Any questions, please ask me. Okay, artificial jurisdictional person and a common seal. I've already explained this point. It's a recap. So quickly go through this so that we can move with the more with more important points. Hi, Sakshi. Good evening. How are you? All right, can we proceed? All right, so I briefly explained to you about what corporate veil also meant. Uh, like I said, a company is legally a, a distinct entity from its members. That is, the members are different and the company is different. It can hold property in its name, contract in its name, carry on transactions uh, in its name, uh, can sue people in its name and can be sued in its name as well. So the corporate veil, like I said, is like a curtain or like a... a, a, a uh, what do you call this, uh, a sort of a covering, uh, cover or shield that shields the member, that uh, a company being distinct from them. So if, if the company does anything wrong, the members directly cannot be held responsible for it. So that is the corporate veil theory. I also explained the Solomon versus Solomon and Co. Uh, example to you. For people who missed it, I'll quickly tell you what happened again. 
Salomon and Salomon and Co uh, Limited. Salomon versus Salomon and Co Limited is a leading case in. Uh... Hi Anubhav, thanks for joining in. Welcome to my session. Uh, Solomon and Solomon and Co Limited is a leading case which defines the corporate veil theory or defines the exception to the corporate veil theory. Now, what happened in that was, uh, hi Sumit, how are you? Thanks for joining in. Hi Mihir, thanks for joining in. Welcome to my session. Okay, so what happened in Solomon versus Solomon and Co Limited was that um, uh, Solomon was holding, uh, he was running a proprietorship business. So finally, he decided to buy or to set up a private limited company with him, his wife, his four sons and daughter as the members. So there were seven members in the private limited company or a public limited company. So then the next thing what he did was through the company, which is Salman, uh, Salman and Co Limited, he bought over the personal assets of the proprietorship business that he was running for about 38,000 pounds. And uh, out of those 38,000 pounds, which he has got, he bought to 20,000 shares at one pound each of the company. And he also subscribed to 10,000 debentures of the company at one pound each. So remaining 8,000 pounds or something, he put into the company as cash. So the company went on with the business for some time, but eventually it went bankrupt. And in the process, the company had bought materials or it owed about dollars, uh, sorry, pound 7,000 to an outside vendor. So they had to pay the vendor. Now the vendor started asking for the money. So, but the company went into bankruptcy and the liquidation proceedings. So the vendor applied to the court saying that Solomon, even though he has 10,000 rupees worth of debentures, he cannot stand before him in terms of um, settlement of his claim simply because he is the owner and he's, he made this company just to shield himself. So like I said, if whenever, whenever a company goes into liquidation, a liquidator is appointed, all the assets of the company are sold off and with the money that is collected, all the liabilities of the company are paid off in a particular sequence starting with first government dues, then salary employee, uh, employees uh, salaries, then your uh, secured debts, then unsecured debts and then sundry creditors and if any money is left, then that is used to pay off the share capital of the company. So in this particular case, as Solomon uh, held debentures, so debentures are termed as secured loans. So he stood above the sundry creditor in terms of repayment, which the sundry creditor did not agree to and filed a case against the company. And the court found out that Solomon had created the whole company in order to avoid payment to the creditor. And so this is called shielding of the corporate veil theory. Now, now we know what is corporate veil, right? The corporate veil is a shield that the, that the members of a company have against the wrongdoings or uh, mistakes of the company. Now, what are the exceptions to the corporate veil? Lift, that's called lifting of the corporate veil. The lifting of corporate veil means lifting of the curtain or lifting of the cover to find out what truly is the matter. Now, if, uh, for example, let's take the, the latest um, case. Now, Shushan Singh Rajput died a few weeks ago. There were, there were various uh, investigations that are happening. The Mumbai police, uh, please remember, this is my opinion. Uh, it may be right or wrong, but whatever I'm going to tell you is my opinion. It's my personal opinion. And I'm not trying to influence or uh, uh, make anyone agree with me. It's my opinion and the way I look at things. So Sushant Singh passed away about a few weeks ago and the Mumbai police carried on the investigation and the Bihar, Bihar police wanted to uh, carry on the investigation. But the Mumbai police quickly said it's a suicide and they closed the case. So, uh, but is that what happened? Hello, Mr. Swatantra, thanks for joining in. Welcome to my session. Now, but was that really the case? Was it really a suicide? Maybe, maybe not. We do not know. So for that, a lot of people started asking for a CBI inquiry so that more investigation is done and the truth really comes out. So there was a lot of resistance that happened and um, Mumbai police did not allow Bihar police to uh, come and inquire about the case or look into the case. But eventually what we see is recently the Supreme Court has allowed Shushant Singh Rajput's case to be handled by the CBI. Now, why do you think the Supreme Court did that? Supreme Court did that because it wanted to lift the curtain over the event or lift the curtain over the suspense and know exactly what happened. So now the CBI will inquire the case and uh, whatever comes out, uh, that will be taken or the people will be taken to task and booked. And if it comes out to be a suicide, then be it. But at least the investigation now is on and it will be more thoroughly done. That is what I believe. 
uh, nothing against the Bihar or Mumbai police. They are, they are very fine people and do their job as well. Uh, hello, Shiv Shankar. Thanks for joining in. Hi, Nandu. Thanks for joining in. Welcome to my session. So that that is an example of lifting the corporate veil, or you know, so so lifting of corporate veil simply means to go a step further that than what we normally do to find out what the truth exactly is. Under normal circumstances, we will not do it. But these are the five exceptions under which the corporate veil of a company is lifted to find out the real culprits or the real wrongdoers of the company. Uh, I hope I'm clear so far. If there is any question, please ask me. Can I have a thumbs up in case uh, you have any doubts or if I'm clear? Am I am I audible? Am I visible? Yes. Okay. Now. Uh, the following are the cases where the company law disregards the principle of corporate personality or, or the principle that the company is legal entity distinct and separate from its shareholder or members. So these are the cases where, a where, where it is disregarded that the company is a separate legal entity and it is treated in these five cases it is treated like the company and the members are the same. This is called lifting of corporate wave. We will discuss each item in detail and like I told you we will Hello, Shiv. You're saying I'm not visible. Am I visible to the others? Am I clearly visible to the others? Yes. Yes. Okay, Shiv. I think unfortunately there's something wrong with your network or your system. You might have to restart your mobile or your system because the others can see me. Now, okay. All right, Shiv. Good. All right. So in these five cases, the corporate veil of a company can be lifted. Uh, and like I told you, that today we will be discussing a lot of case laws, which are coming up very soon. All right. So to determine the character of a company, to find out whether the co whether co-enemy or friend, whether the company is an enemy or a friend, in this case, the court might lift the corporate veil. So many times what happens that there are perpetrators or infiltrators who enter the country in order to harm the country. So if they have formed a company which uh, which with the ultimate goal of which hi Surya welcome to my session thanks for joining in. Um, so if the ultimate objective of forming such a company is to harm India or harm the country or harm a state in that case the corporate veil can be lifted up. you know and in the beginning it might just seem a very normal thing that this is just another private limited company but slowly when things start going wrong that is when the, the lifting of corporate veil becomes mandatory to see what is the whole purpose of that company, whether the company is genuine or it has a hidden motive or an ulterior motive to protect revenue tax. So many times people form a lot of companies uh, just to avoid or evade taxes. The taxes could be your income tax, your GST, your uh, professional taxes, your basic your registration and stamp duty and all that. So a lot of times people avoid or people start off new companies in order to avoid or evade taxes. So the corporate veil of companies can also be lifted when the authorities and the court feel that uh, this company is in existence only to evade tax and nothing else. And um, the, that, that gives rise to the requirement of lifting the corporate veil to avoid a legal obligation. What do you mean by uh, to avoid a legal obligation. Now, so many times a legal obligation in terms of em uh, employee provident fund, employee state insurance, uh, bonuses to employees, all these amounts are payable when the number of employees crosses a particular number. So the, the, the threshold for registration and payment of these statutory dues, these are, these are a few of the statutory dues that I'm talking about. So the threshold for payment of these uh, statutory dues depends on the number of employees. So let's say a company has 100 employees. So if a company has 100 employees, then the payment of bonus, employee provident fund, employee state insurance also becomes applicable to the company. So but the company does not want to pay it. So what does the company do? The company starts another company, its branch office or subsidiary company or whatever, and transfers a few employees on that role. Why is this done? This is done with the pure objective. So that if there are 100 employees here, it becomes 50 50. And then the corresponding law or corresponding obligation can be avoided. So if the authorities and if the courts feel that this was done with an objective to avoid a legal obligation, then they can pierce through the corporate wheel or lift the corporate veil and find out what the true objective is. Now, how do you think 
let's say a company abc private limited starts another company cde private limited just to avoid payment of bonus and shift some employees there and uh, the court wants to know or the authorities thinks that this is done purely to avoid taxes how does a company check so the basic thing that the courts and the authorities will do is is call for all the documents the memorandums and uh, the director details and everything about both the companies and if the directors in both the companies are the same or the shareholders of both the companies are the same or the companies under the control of abc uh, like i'm saying cd private limited is under the control of abc private limited in that case it establishes that this is just a company created to avoid legal obligations obviously there are a lot of other things that need to be seen i'm just telling you up front so in that case the corporate veil can be lifted to find out what the true objective of the company is formation of subsidiaries to act as agents like i said again a lot of times uh, companies create subsidiaries do we know what is subsidiary can anyone tell me what is a subsidiary what's a subsidiary anyone shiv shankar additional additional what hi shahid thanks for joining in hi surya thanks for joining in welcome to my session shiv can you explain that okay uh, a subsidiary company is a company where 51% of the share capital of the company support have come i'm sorry shiv i don't understand what you're saying um okay uh, for example a subsidiary is a company where 51% or more of that share capital is held by another company let's say abc private limited holds 51% or more of the share capital of cde private limited so cde private limited is said to be the subsidiary of abc private limited and abc private limited is said to be the holding company of cde private limited so that's a subsidiary relationship so the minimum uh, shareholding that is that needs to be done is 51% yes ritija bansal has sent a reply a company that is owned or controlled by another company which is called the parent company parent or holding company yes you're right and the controlling event here is 51% or more of the share capital like i said so ritija you missed the point important point of 51% then only the subsidiary relationship is established hey, are you clear is there any question so far any question please anyone all right the next point a company formed for fraud or improper conduct or to defeat law again if a company is formed just to defeat the law or to fraud or to defraud the customers or to defraud the vendors in that case the corporate veil of that company can be lifted to find out who the owners of the company are and what is their true objective so company formed for fraud improper conduct or to defeat law in that case if the courts and the authorities have sufficient reasons to believe that such a company is meant for fraud improper conduct or to defeat the law then they can lift the corporate veil and see who's behind that corporate veil and find out the, the true culprits please remember even though the authorities or someone may have uh, sufficient reasons to do that it does not necessarily mean that the people behind the corporate veil are uh, guilty it is a preliminary test and if the authorities have a reason to believe so they can do it and if after that the people behind the corporate veil are are innocent then be it but there is uh, but the authorities and everyone have complete right to lift the corporate veil so what we are discussing right now are circumstances under which the corporate veil is raised any questions here please ask me before we move on to case laws hi sonu thanks for joining in welcome to my session all right now let's go through the points in detail what we just discussed to determine the character character of the company to find out whether co enemy or friend it is true that unlike a natural person a company does not have a mind or conscience therefore it cannot be a friend or a foe it may however be characterized as an enemy company if its affairs are under the control of people of an enemy country 
For this purpose, the court may examine the character of the persons who are really at the helm of the affairs of the company. Like I told you, uh, when it comes to the protection, the integrity and sovereignty of the, the, the country, India is very particular about this. So anyone can come here and start a business. India and uh, uh, even to these days we see Mr. Modi is, is uh, promoting the concept of uh, make in India and doing business in India, ease of doing business in India. So a lot of foreign investors, a lot of foreign people are also allowed to, allowed to come to India and start companies. So the first point means if let's say a company is started off by a member of an enemy country. Okay, I wouldn't name any country, but if there is any enemy country and a person comes from that country and starts a company here. And if the authorities have enough reason to believe that the person from the enemy country has created this country to harm the created this company to harm the country. In that case, they could lift the corporate veil and see the true character of the people who are behind that company or who manage the affairs of the company. Obviously, if the company is in the hands of the wrong people, wrong things will happen. If the, if the company is in the hands of the right people, right things will happen. So that to find out whether the right people are behind the company or wrong people behind the company, the corporate veil has to be uh, lifted. When I keep saying corporate veil has to be lifted, it simply means the we need to ignore the fact that the company is a separate legal entity. So whenever we lift, lift the corporate veil, we treat the company and the members as one. We do not treat them as separately simply because a company is not a real person. A company is not a not a person like you and me. So it is it is uh, functional through a board of directors who take care of the company. So if the board of directors are enemies or people with wrong intentions, then the company will also perform uh, or do activities with the wrong intentions or malified intentions. So any questions, please ask me. Okay, to protect revenue and tax in certain matters concerning law of taxes, duties and stamps, particularly where question of controlling interest is an issue. So like I said, whenever it appears to the authorities that a company is created just to protect, just to avoid revenue, when I what do you mean by revenue? Revenue here means uh, taxes and other things to the government. They call it revenue and tax. So if a company is created just to avoid or evade taxes, then the authorities can lift the corporate veil to find out who the real owner is and what his real intention is to avoid a legal obligation where it was found that the sole purpose of the formation of the company was to avoid a legal obligation. The, the court can order the piercing of the veil to look at the real transaction. Like I told you, like I told you that of, of uh, payment of bonus and payment of PF and all that, if a company has created another company just to avoid all these legal obligations, in that case, the corporate veil can be lifted and the true intention of the company can be found out. Now, on the next page, I have a case study relating to, uh, to, to uh, lifting of corporate veil to avoid a legal obligation. Let's quickly run through this. First, let's read it and then we will discuss it. So the case study goes like this. Workmen of Associated Rubber Industry Limited versus Associated Rubber Industry Limited. That's the name of the case. The facts of the case. The facts of the case are A Limited purchased shares of B Limited by investing a sum of rupees 4,50,000. Okay, so A Limited purchased the shares of B Limited for rupees 4,50,000. The dividend in respect of these shares was shown in the profit and loss account of the company year after year all right so the dividend we all know what is dividend dividend is the profits dividend is a share of the profits that a company distributes to its shareholders as a incentive a company may or may not declare dividend they are under no legal obligation to declare dividend but most of the times when a company makes profits year on year they declare dividend now okay now how many of you do not know what dividend means i will explain it before we continue, anyone or does everyone know what dividend is? Hi, Payal. Welcome to the session. Thank you so much. Uh, what is dividend? Anyone here who, who wants me to explain dividend to you? Okay. Now, dividend. Now, for example, let's say ABC Limited, ABC Private Limited uh, is running the business of uh, manufacturing furniture. So they manufacture they manufacture 
furniture and they buy and sell or they, they sell furniture and all that and the end of the year the profit and loss shows a profit of 1 lakh that means all their sales minus all the expenses and everything a profit of 1 lakh is there in their profit and loss account now this 1 lakh is after they have paid all the income taxes and everything this is free money free money in the sense uh, after all the taxes are paid this money can be utilized by the company to do anything so the company has two choices here either the company reinvests the 1 lakh into its business that means if they have any expansion program or if they may have an expansion program after six months they can retain that 1 lakh in their general reserve as profit or if the company is very happy with the performance that year they can distribute that 1 lakh as a dividend to its shareholders in the proportion of their shareholding so let's say if a if the if the total number of shares of the company is 10,000 so every share of the company will get a dividend of rupees 10 so if a person holds 100 shares he will get 100 into 10 1000 rupees as dividend it is not necessary that the company declares the entire amount as dividend they could keep 50,000 and they could declare 50,000 as dividend that's the company's choice they could keep 80,000 and declare 20,000 as dividend whatever the company wants it can do it can also keep 100% and declare zero as dividend nothing can stop the company so let's come back to the example so the dividend in respect of those shares was shown in the profit and loss of the company year after year in which company in B's company it was taken into account for the purpose of calculating the bonus payable to workmen of the company sometime in 1968 the company transferred the shares of B limited to C limited a subsidiary wholly owned by it Thus, the dividend income did not find place in the profit and loss of A, with the result that the surplus available for the purpose of payment of bonus to the workmen got rejected. Okay, so let me explain the first paragraph to you. Now, A company bought uh, shares in B company by investing a sum of rupees 4,50,000, right? So, B's shares are held by A. So, B company, when it declares dividend, A is supposed to receive it. So whenever the company declared dividend, A showed it in his profit and loss that so much of amount, 100 rupees or 200 rupees of dividend is receivable from B as dividend. Now they kept on passing this entry in the PNL account. And based on this entry, they actually thought they have enough money to pay bonuses to the employees. But eventually what happened, they did not have that money, which was there in the PNL, which was shown in the PNL, and they could not pay the bonus. So let's read further. Here a company created a subsidiary and transferred to it its investment holdings in a bid to reduce its liability to pay bonus to its workers. Thus the Supreme Court brushed aside the, se the separate existence of the subsidiary company. The new company so formed has no assets of its own except those transferred to it by the principal company with no business or income or its of its own except receiving dividends from shares transferred to it by the principal company and serving no purpose except to reduce the gross profit of the principal company so as to reduce the amount paid as bonus to workman all right now now we've read the whole thing so let's let's try to understand the whole scenario again a buys shares in b b year on year tries to show dividend declared which a shows in the profit and loss account as dividend received or receivable from b even though b has not paid it now suddenly a the a thinks that oh i have to pay a lot of bonus to my employees because my profit and loss is showing me a good profit so what it does it creates a subsidiary company c now what is a subsidiary a subsidiary company is a company in which a company holds 51 percent or more of its share capital and transfers the entire dividend the shares what it held in b to that company so now a has transferred the shares which it held in b to company c so will will the company a still receive dividend no company a will not receive dividend whereas company c will receive the dividend so why did the company a do this the company a did this with the sole objective of reducing its profits so that it does not have to pay bonus to its employees now the court found out that there's something fishy here and it called for all the information it called for all the profit and loss of a b and c so on on, on scrutiny it found that C had no assets. C was just a sham company or a uh, uh, what do you what do you call a namesake company, which did not have any money except the dividend that it received from C, and so it could not pay bonus to its employees. 
So the court held that A will have to pay bonus to its employees and this whole transaction of creating a subsidiary and transferring the shares of C to them is not valid. Please take about 30 seconds to one minute and read this case law and ask me any question. Hi Sahil, welcome, thanks for joining in. Take about 30 seconds and read this. Okay, formation of subsidiaries to act as agents. A company sometimes be regarded as an agent or trustee of its members or of another company and may therefore be deemed to have lost its individuality in favor of its principal. Here the principal will be held liable for the acts of the company. Now, we all know, hi Sneha, thanks for joining in. Welcome to my session. We all know how an agency relationship works. Let's say you have a product and you want to sell it in different parts of the country. So obviously, one first choice is for you to travel those countries and uh, sell your products, which is quite expensive and time consuming. Or the next option for you is to hire an agent who will sell your products on behalf of you. And on whatever sales he makes, he will charge you a fixed amount as commission. So a lot of cases, uh, a company is also created in such a way as a subsidiary that the subsidiary company is an agent of the holding company. Agent simply means that whatever the parent company or whatever the principal says, the agent is supposed to do. So many a times the subsidiary company is created purely for that purpose. So if that happens, the corporate veil could be lifted to find out who is really the controlling interest behind the subsidiary company. Okay, any questions, please ask. Come. Hi Vishal, thanks for joining in. Welcome to my session. I hope you're doing good. Company form for fraud, improper conduct or to defeat law. Uh, where the device of incorporation is adopted for some illegal or improper pur purpose. Example, to defeat or circumvent law, to defraud creditors or to avoid legal obligations. In that case, the corporate veil can be done. So, now let's come back to the Indian Contracts Act 1872 again. A contract, one of the essential features of a contract is that the object should be lawful. In case the object is unlawful, a contract is considered to be void. Now come back here again. In case a company is solely created for an improper, illegal or unlawful purpose, in that case, the corporate veil of that company can be raised to find out who are the people behind it, what are their intentions and if they have done any wrong acts to take them to task and book them for their wrong deeds. Now, these were the five exceptions uh, where the corporate veil could be lifted. If any of you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Please feel free to ask. If not, we will move to case laws relating to corporate lifting of corporate will. I also request all the viewers to uh, if you want to know when my sessions are there and to, to get intimations on my sessions to please follow my profile uh, on the Unacademy app. There is a follow button. You can click the follow button and you will be intimated whenever I'm taking my sessions on the various subjects which may interest you. Uh, hi Kalpana, thanks for joining in. Welcome to my session. Okay, let's move to case laws. Now the first case law that is for prevention of fraud and improper conduct. So this is a case law which says that the corporate veil of a company can be lifted if the company is uh, incorporated for a fraudulent or improper conduct. So let's just read the case law first and then I will explain it to you. In Guilford Motor Company versus Horn, Horn had been employed by the company under an agreement that he shall not solicit customers of the company or compete with it for a certain period of time after leaving its employment. Hi Kalpana. Uh, after ceasing to be employed by the plaintiff, Horn formed a company which carried on a competing business and caused the whole of its shares to be allotted to his wife and an employee of the company who were appointed to its directors. It was held that since the defendant, that is Horn, in fact controlled the company, its formation was a mere cloak or sham 
enable him to break his agreement with the plaintiff. Accordingly, an injunction was issued against him and against the company he had formed, restraining them from soliciting the plaintiff's customers. Okay, now please take about 30 seconds and read the case law, then I will explain the case law to you. Thank you, Ritija. It means a lot. Uh, thanks for uh, following my profile on the on Academy app. I request the others to follow it as well so that you get timely notifications about my sessions. Take 30 seconds, read the case law, and then I will explain it to you. This is a good case law which shows uh, that the corporate veil of the company can be lifted when it appears to be that the company is created for fraudulent and improper purposes. Okay, let's take the situation. Now, if you're wondering, then under the Companies Act, how did we get Guilford Motor Company versus Horn? How did we get these names? Please remember, I told you there is a Companies Act 2013. There was a Companies Act 1956. And there was a Companies Act which was, which was there before independence. So at that time, uh, the, this case is from that time where uh, it was mostly the British. So this is one of the, one of the British case laws. Which is, which is applicable in India. Now in this case law, hi Kunal, thanks for joining in. Uh, welcome to my session. Now let me explain the case law to you. In Guilford Motor Company versus Horn, so the plaintiff, the plaintiff, please remember, is always the person who files the case. He is the aggrieved party. And versus Horn, Horn is the defendant. In any case, there are two parties, a plaintiff and a defendant. Plaintiff is the aggrieved party that files the case and defendant is the person against whom the case is filed. Uh, hello, Mr. Shila. Thanks for joining in. Welcome to my session. I hope you enjoyed. Okay. So in Guilford Motor Company versus Horn, what happened? Horn used to work in Guilford Motor Company. He worked for some time and finally he decided to quit the company. He quit the company Guilford Motor and Company. But while he was working in the company, he had he had signed a agreement that once he quits Guilford Motor Company, he will not carry on any competing business with which is the same business as Guilford Motor Company. So he had signed that agreement and uh, he continued in the company. Finally, one day he quit the company. Now, as per the agreement and things like that, he should not have ethically, he should not have uh, ethically and legally, he should not have carried on competing business. But now his intentions were wrong. He wanted to carry, because he had learned the business in Guilford Motor Company, he wanted to carry out the same business and make profits and maybe steal the clients and uh, employees of uh, Guilford Motor Company. So what he did, instead of starting a company in his name, he started a company in his wife's name and one of the employees of the company. That is the new company. Now, by, by doing this, he thought, oh, I'm safe. You know, the agreement says I should not start a competing business. So I haven't started a competing business. My wife and an employee has started the competing business. So he thought he's safe. But Guilford Motor Company actually went ahead and filed a case against him in the court and said that the whole purpose of Horn creating a company in the name of his wife and employee was to defeat the purpose of the law and for a fraudulent purpose of starting a competing business and taking away all the clients of Guilford Motor Company. So the court obviously called for all the documents. It called for the documents of Guilford Motor Company, uh, Horn's new company, saw the documents and saw who is the actual owner of the company. So even though on paper it was Horn's wife and the employee who were the directors of the company, directors and shareholders of the company, which made them the management of the company. But the court observed that both of them were under the control of Horn. Indirectly or directly, Horn controlled both of them. So their actions were actually being controlled by Horn. So it cannot be held that the employee and his wife were completely independent people who carried on a competing business. Uh, the links were connected and the, the it came out that Horn was actually carrying on a competing business uh, with Guilford Motor Company through his wife and employee. So immediately the court gave an injunction order. An injunction order is an order stopping the particular act. So the court ordered that the company be stopped and the operations of the company be stopped. And the, the case was given in favor of Guilford Motor Company. So this was a case where the 
uh, corporate veil was lifted. How was the corporate veil lifted? A company was doing business, but then the court wanted to see who is behind the business. So when it lifted the corporate veil, it found out that the that Hone's wife and employee were behind the business, which who were actually controlled by Hone. So the whole purpose for which the company was created was fraudulent and for improper purposes. So the court gave an injunction order against him and the company he had formed. Are we clear about this? Hi, Sumit. Are we clear about this? Any questions, please ask. Yes, Ritija, any, any questions? Thanks, Kalpana. Okay. Let's move to the next case law. This is also a case law for prevention of fraud and improper conduct. Similarly, in Jones versus Lipman, seller of a piece of land sought to evade specific performance of a contract for the sale of the land by conveying the land to a company which he formed for the purchase. Initially, the company was formed by third parties and the vendor purchased the whole of its shares from them. Had the shares registered in the name of himself and his nominee and had he and the nominee appointed directors. It was held that specific performance of the contract cannot be resisted by the vendor by conveyance of the land to the company, which was a mere facade for avoidance of a contract of sale and specific performance of the contract was therefore ordered against the vendor and the company. Now, now take 30 seconds and read the case law and then I will explain the case law for you. Okay, shall I explain? Now, this is another case, Jones versus Lipman. So Jones is the plaintiff and Lipman is the defendant. Now, what happened? Jones and Lipman entered into an agreement wherein Lipman was supposed to sell the piece of land to Jones. Now, everything went on well. Lipman, Lipman agreed to sell the land to him, but suddenly I think his intentions went bad. He did not want to sell the land to Jones. Maybe he was getting a better rate or maybe he just wanted to run away with the money. So you, you never know. So his intentions were wrong. So what Jones did, what Lipman did, instead of selling the property or selling the land to Jones, he started another company. Okay. And he sold the land to that company. Now, okay, fine. Chalo, fair enough. He sold the land to that company. But on when, when investigation was done, uh, whom did the company belong to? On investigations, it was found out that the company ultimately belonged to Lipman himself. So instead of starting the company himself, one of Lipman's vendors started the company and then bought and then took and then later on Lipman went and bought the shares from that vendor, became the owner of the company and made him and his vendor the directors of the company. So eventually the company to which Lipman sold his land was his own company. So if you look at the whole transaction, he sold his land to himself through his company in order to avoid selling it to Jones. So Jones went to court, asked for the specific performance of the contract between Jones and, Lip and Lipman. So the court actually investigated, looked through all the documents and everything and actually found out that uh, Lipman had done this with the ulterior motive or a wrong intention of avoiding the sale of land to Jones. So he sold his land to his company uh, himself, so which was not agreed. And then when the company lifted the corporate veil of Lipman's new company, it found out that the owner of the company was actually Lipman and his vendor. So even though they did not do it straight, they did it roundabout, but eventually the court found out what it is and court ordered for the specific performance that Lipman was supposed to sell the land to Jones. And that's what happened. Now, how did that happen? That happened only because the corporate veil was lifted. Yes. Please go through this and ask me any questions. Hi Anjali, thanks for joining in. Welcome to the session. Go through this case study and ask me any questions you have.
can we proceed okay now this is another case study or couple of case studies uh, to show that the corporate veil was lifted when there was a formation of a sub subsidiary to act purely as an agent this is a case study again what happened let's look at the first case study let's read the case study and then i will explain it to you in merchandise transport limited versus british transport commission a transport company wanted to obtain licenses for its vehicle but it could not do so if it made the application in its own name it therefore formed a subsidiary company and the application for licenses was made in the name of the subsidiary the vehicles were to be transferred to the subsidiary held the parent and the subsidiary company were one commercial unit and the application for licenses was rejected now see in this in this this case is a pure example where a subsidiary company is created to act purely as an agent of another company in merchandise transport limited versus british transport commission uh, it was held that a transport company wanted to obtain licenses for its vehicle now they had some law <coughs> that the company if it made an application in its own name it would not get the licenses so so the company thought okay let me get to a smart idea let me try and open a subsidiary to act as my agent and let the let the company get that the subsidiary get the licenses in its own name and then those licenses can be transferred to the holding company this is what the company thought uh, british that is the uh, uh, merchandise transport limited thought that that's what it can do so it started a subsidiary and the subsidiary applied for the licenses for vehicles in order to get it because the parent company that is merchandise transport limited could not get the licenses in its own name so in that case what happened then <clears throat> the court the british transport commission filed a case against merchandise transport limited because it had a, it had a slight idea that maybe uh, british transport the merchandise transport limited is doing it on purpose and is just creating a subsidiary to avoid or to defeat the purpose of law so on investigation it was found out that the subsidiary company which had applied for the licenses is completely owned and controlled by merchandise transport limited and the court held the transaction to be a sham transaction that means a false transaction which is done purely to defeat the purpose of law and those licenses were cancelled the application for the licenses made by merchandise transport limited in its subsidiary's name were cancelled so this is where again the corporate veil of the subsidiary company which merchandise transport limited created was lifted to find out who is really behind the really behind the uh, application okay in state of up versus renu sagar power co the supreme court held that where the holding company holds 100% shares in a subsidiary company and the latter is created only for the purpose of the holding company corporate veil can be lifted this again if you look at that case law state of up uh, versus the renu sagar power it was held that where a 100% subsidiary of a particular company is created to fulfill the objects of the holding company purely in that case the corporate veil of both the holding company and the subsidiary company can be lifted to find out the true intention and objective of that company please take a minute and go through this case study and ask me if you have any doubts anyone any doubts please ask me let's proceed all right again another case study in jr exports limited versus bses rajdhani power limited the appellant number 1 company acquired entire share capital of appellant number 2 company which was a registered consumer of electricity connection granted at its factory premises and on finding that electricity was being consumed by appellant number 1 electricity board passed in passed impunged order demanding the subletting charges from appellant 2 Court held that by applying principle of piercing the corp corporate veil, both companies appeared to be the same entity. Therefore, there was no question of subletting. Okay. Now, in this case, what happened? The BSES Rajdhani Power Limited <coughs> filed a case against JR Exports Limited. 
Now, JR Export Limited had an electricity connection in its name through which it was consuming electricity. Along with JR Exports Limited, it also had another entity in its premises that was consuming the power along with JR Exports Limited. So, uh, BSCF, the power company that is Rajdhani Power Limited, found out this and actually uh, filed a case against uh, JR Exports Limited saying that they are subletting the electricity to someone else. So JR Exports said, no, we are not subletting anything to anyone. But the power company insisted and they filed a case on JR Exports Limited. On reaching the court, when the court found out and asked for documents and pierced the corporate veil, the court found out that the JR Exports Limited and the other entity on the premises was one and the same. It was not a different entity. When it lifted the corporate veil, it found out that both these companies were the same. And so the question of subletting did not arise at all and the case was dismissed. There was no subletting. So subletting charges and all could not be, could not be uh, claimed by the power limited company because on lifting the corporate veil, it was found out that uh, JR Exports Limited and the other company on its premises were one and the same and the power was being consumed by one entity. Uh, take 30 seconds, read this slide, read this case study and let me know if there's any doubts. Can we proceed? Hi, Pritesh. Thanks for joining in. Thank you so much. Okay. Now, protection of revenue. Now, this is a case law where the corporate veil of a company was lifted in order to protect the revenue of a state or the country. That is the taxes. Let me read the entire case law and then I will explain it to you. Uh, in, Din in Sir Dinshaw Manik G. Petit, the SSE was a millionaire earning huge income by way of dividend and interest. He formed four private companies and transferred his investments to each of those companies in exchange for their shares. The dividend and interest income was received by Sir Dinshaw as a pretended loan. It was held that the company was formed by the SSC purely and simply as a means of avoiding tax and the company was nothing more than SSC himself. It did no business but was created simply as a legal entity to ostensibly receive the dividends and interest and to hand them over to SSC and pretended loans. Okay, this is a very interesting case law. Uh, now, what happened in this particular case law? Sir Dinshaw Manik G. Petit was a person. Hi, Simran. Thanks for joining in. Welcome to my session. Uh, Sir Dinshaw Manik G. Petit was a person. He was a millionaire. He had a lot of investments and a lot of shares and other investments through which he used to get dividend and interest. Now, if one person receives a lot of dividend and interest. Hi, Grishma. How are you? Thanks for joining in. Welcome to my session. Now, if you receive a lot of interest and dividend, Obviously, more the income, more the taxes you pay. So in this case, Mr. Sir Din Dinshaw Manikji wanted to avoid those taxes. So what he did, he started four companies, new companies uh, by him. Okay, now he was the owner of those companies. And whatever investments he had in those companies, he slowly equally transferred all those investments in the company's name. So ideally, the, when the investments are in the company's name, the, the interest and the dividend that is received on those investments will also be in the company's name. Yes. So what happened? The investments and the, the investments kept on paying the interest and the dividends to Sir Dinshaw Manikji Petit. And he kept showing that he is receiving those incomes on behalf of those four companies. So what happened where he was receiving 100 rupees as interest and dividend, he divided that 100 rupees into 25, 25, 25, 25 into those four companies. So what happened? His tax liability was reduced and the tax liability was split equally among those four companies. So obviously it was a loss of taxes to the government. So the government called uh, for all the records. They called for all the records of Sir Dinshaw Manikji and the four companies he created and later found out that he was the owner of those companies and because he was the owner of the companies the ultimate benefit of those companies or ultimate profits from those companies were coming back to him and he had created those companies purely to avoid and evade taxes 
those companies did not hold assets those companies did not carry on any business did not have employees did not have any expenses and were purely created to evade taxes or to reduce the taxes of sir dinshaw manager well uh, he was trying to be a little uh, clever here but then the the department and the revenue authorities outsmarted him and they lifted the corporate veil of those four companies found out that who is the actual director or shareholder of those companies connected it with mr dinshaw manager and found out that he created those companies just to avoid his tax liabilities so it was held that the four companies were sham companies and the entire profits of those four companies were added back to sir dinshaw manager's accounts and taxes were demanded accordingly similarly in cit versus shri minakshi mills cit means commissioner of income tax uh, mills where the veil had been used for evasion of taxes and duties the court upheld the piercing of the veil to look into the real transaction so similarly in that particular case um, shri minakshi mills had carried on certain transactions purely with a view to evade taxes so the court held on proper investigation that the whole uh, the real transaction was done by shri minakshi mills and whatever adjustments they had done or created entities they had done it to evade the taxes so the tax departments were allowed to make their claims hi jay how are you thanks for joining in hi harshda thanks for joining in so with this case law i would like you to go through this case law and let me know if you have any questions and um, just take your time and in today's session if you have any other questions just let me know i will be happy to answer it. anything any questions take a couple of minutes read this slide read the previous okay let's look at one one la one more last case study for today the economic offense case study in shantanu ray versus union of india it was held that the company had violated section 11a of the central excises and salt act 1944 the court held that the veil of the corporate entity could be lifted by adjudicating authorities so as to determine as to which of the directors was concerned with the evasion of the excise duty by reason of fraud concealment of willful misstatement or suppression of facts or contravention of the provisions of the act and rules made under please remember there was an act called the central excise and salt act 1944 which is no longer into existence so this is an old case study this is a case study by union of india so whenever a, a, a government department files a case against an individual it is always said union of india and the person against whom the case was filed was santanu ray so here again it was the the court wanted to find out who exactly which director exactly of the company was responsible for evasion of central excise by fraud and concealment or willful mistake or suppression of facts or the contravention of the provisions of the act so after thorough investigation and thorough hearing the court held that the corporate veil of the company could be lifted in order to find out who that director was who did the mischief so it was done and mr santanu ray was found out he was caught and then he was penalized by the union of india through various penalties and punishments so this was a case study of economic offenses where the corporate veil of the company was lifted uh, i would like to end today's session here in my next session on companies act part 3 i will be continuing with the case laws and discussing a lot of other important and interesting topics i request all of you to join in there and i also request you to go to my profile and click on the follow button to get uh, immediate updates about my next session so that you can attend that i would love to have you all in my next session thank you so much and uh, good night see you around